Welcome, everyone. This is the session for visual literacy. Um, I'm being live streamed, and it's the first time I've ever been live streamed. They just told me, so I'm freaking out slightly. So I'm just gonna just gonna do my thing. All right. So visual literacy and education. I feel like this is one of those key words that we hear all the time. One of those buzzwords, visual literacy. Uh, it's something that we assess students on now with SBAC, right? They have to watch videos and answer questions. But I feel like, as an educator myself, I don't spend enough time with my students working on visual literacy with them. Um, so the idea of comprehending and making meaning of visual images um, or multimedia, and we do it all the time subconsciously. I have a four-year-old daughter, and I watched her as she was learning how to use her iPad and, and just taking in the world um, that visuals was what she got first because she didn't have her letters, she didn't have uh, her words for a while. We started with ASL for her, American Sign Language. So that idea of visual communication was huge. Um, I found that I myself with my friend group will have complete conversations through text and not say a word. We just send memes <laughs> and we send animated, I say GIFs. I know there's a huge controversy over here, and I'm on somebody's team, either GIF or JIF. I'm a GIF team. I don't know. Anybody else? GIF? Anyone feel very strongly about it? If I'm offending you with GIF, I do apologize, but I just have to stay true to myself. So um, animated GIFs, right? So I'll go back through the stream, and no one typed anything. It was just a series of images, and yet we're communicating. Um, and we're, we're having a whole conversation through these images. Um, and our students do it too. Snapchat. Right? All they do is take pictures of themselves and send them to one another. Uh, and so I think harnessing that in a classroom is really important. Um, and so I have gone through and collected um, a bunch of different ideas. Hopefully there will be that golden Easter egg that you're looking for in here somewhere. Um, I, this is not specific to any particular grade level, although there are some um, uh, resources in here that do have some age limits, and I'll try and point those out as I go through. Um, but uh, we, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, it's not specific to any grade level. It's not specific to any curriculum um, uh, discipline either. So it could be science, it could be history. Hopefully you'll find something that applies uh, along the way somewhere in here. So, like I said, we have lots of standards dealing with visual literacy, uh, dealing with the idea of being able to interpret information, being able to give information uh, with images, um, that students can uh, read a wide range of print and non-print, that they can interpret, that they have this, this ability to understand what they're probably doing subconsciously, uh, what they're already taking in, and to be able to really harness that and strengthen their abilities to do so. So the first is a gallery walk. I love gallery walks. Uh, you can do these digitally or physically. When I was first getting my uh, credential, I was working in a middle school, and we were teaching the novel Dragon Wings. And Dragon Wings is about um, an immigrant who comes over from China to work in San Francisco because um, the father is building the railroad system. And, um, and so there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of culture there. And I wanted my students to have a visual of that as they were going through the text. And so uh, one of my colleagues had these huge 16 by 20 pictures of all these historical pictures of um, people on boats in their cultural clothing, um, what San Francisco looked like before everything was paved, although I think they just paved over the wagon routes um, because <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, but they just have all these pictures, and so I put them up all around the room, and I would have just an essential question, something that wasn't even tied to content, just something like, you know, what's your first impression? Or what do you think these people are feeling? Or um, what, what draws your attention to this picture first? And so I just did it old school with pictures around the room, which is a great way to do it. Um, but you can also do a, a digital version as well. Um, and so having the students look at images, take those images in, figure out how they're feeling about them, what they're thinking about them, and then ultimately have them apply those to what you're reading or what you're going to be discussing or analyzing just adds to that, uh, that web that students are building in their brain, that they're putting all these things together. So I did create an online version. This is for Kafferboy. Um, which I teach, I am a secondary teacher, so 
just for your understanding of the things that I give to my students and what we talk about. So we talk about symbolism and flags with color, with shape. The signs, how do they make them feel? What do they remind them of? Having them I come up with ideas as to why something might be significant. It could be tied to topics. It could be tied to themes that you want to ultimately bring up for them. Um, and you can have this blending of modern pictures as well as historical pictures and bring all of that into them and, and talk about um, street art and different things that are coming up in their, in their world. So the gallery walk is the first, uh, the first thing. The next thing is a picture resume. Um, Oftentimes we hear about resumes, but having a picture one is really fun. I did a, an ed tech leader program through um, a couple years ago, and they asked me to make a picture resume, which I had never really thought of, and I felt kind of silly having not thought about it yet. Um, but it was something that I introduced to my students. So my students, when I taught a freshman seminar course, which is basically a tenure plan, you know, who are you, what do you want, and how are you going to get there? And we set our freshmen up for that. And we had them visualize it. We do vision boards, um, and then we also do this, this visual... Uh, resume, this picture resume. And part of it is personal and part of it is professional or school related. And it's a great opportunity for students. And I cheated a little bit because I did put a quote on there. But um, it really allows the students to project who they are. Um, this is also a great way to get students to introduce themselves to a classroom uh, when you're first getting ready with your students to kind of having them introduce themselves. You can make it however you would like to, but basically just that idea of using pictures to tell the story, just kind of a storyboard of yourself. Fake news and quotes. <laughs> Fake news, right? It's all we hear about anymore, I feel like. Uh, in fact, we just had a conversation in my district the other day about fake news. An article came out, and they were talking about the staggering number of people who can't differentiate fake news from real, legit news. And then, of course, there's a lot of controversy over who determines what is real or not real. Um, but I think it's important. The first time I ever saw a quote that made me question whether someone actually said it was this Abraham Lincoln one. The problem with quotes from the internet is that it's very hard to verify their authenticity. Abraham Lincoln. I'm still on Facebook. I know it's not like the new cool thing to be on anymore, but I'm still on Facebook. And I see these all the time. There's a picture of Obama with this quote next to it. Or there's a picture of you know, some famous person with a quote next to it. And how often do we just like or reshare and not validate whether that person actually said that? Uh, and so that happens often. And uh, just having the students be aware of that. I've caught myself liking something and then going, oops, wait a minute. I don't even know if they actually said that. And then going back, doing my research, and then either calling myself out, and, oh, okay, they didn't actually say this, <laughs> or just deleting it altogether because I didn't want to perpetuate that, that um, false information. I've also seen people call other people out. Hey, I did some research on this, and this isn't actually something that they said. But how many people take the steps to validate that information? So we need to teach our students that they can't just take face value, right? They see it on the internet. A lot of our students of this generation are getting their news on social media. And so are they actually fact-checking? Are they making sure? Um, so there is a quiz here from Channel One News that you can click on, and it has different um, articles that are on there. And they talk about looking at the URL, being able to verify whether it's a valid URL or a URL that would be used by a reputable publisher. Uh, they also talk about the images and the way that the page is laid out, where you can look for information on the authors. And so they give all this information on there and it quizzes you and it tells you when you take the quiz how you can verify or tell the difference between the two. I, felt, I feel like this is very relevant. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Kevin Hart is, the comedian, but he was recently in a car accident. And I was getting all of these alerts and seeing all of this news. And there was a lot of you know, talk about it, but not anything really clear. We knew that he had a spinal injury and or back injury. And I kept seeing his rep has not commented. His rep had not, has not commented. I thought, oh, that's terrible. That's awful. And then on Facebook, a friend of mine went, oh my gosh, this is so terrible, and posted an article. I clicked on it, and it said, this comedian has damaged his vocal cords and is paralyzed. And here's a, a statement from his rep. I thought, oh my gosh. And so I read it, but it was the only article out there. It was false, 
But how many people saw that? And I went through the feed later after I verified it, and all the people that were just taking it at face value, oh my gosh, that's so terrible, that's awful, I can't believe it. And you know, finally some people were like, oh, I, actually this isn't true, I didn't hear it. But that idea of, of checking multiple sources to make sure that the information is the same, and going out there and, and doing some of that legwork, because it's really on us as the, as the consumer of that information to make sure that it's, that it's valid. Uh, especially if you're doing research and if you're using that in a paper to prove a point, you want to make sure that you've got valid information. Silhouettes. This is super fun. Jeffrey Heil uh, was the one who introduced this to me at an EdTech conference that I went to um, in Pleasanton last year. And I love the idea of it. I had done a lot of collages. I had done a lot of visuals with my students, but I loved the idea of them putting those visuals inside of another visual and giving it that much more power. So the one up on the upper right is his. Um, and so I thought, well, this would be a great way, again, because we have our students in freshman seminar introduce themselves. What if they took a silhouette of themselves and then filled it with all of those things, like kind of merging that picture resume with the, uh, with this silhouette idea. And then the top left and the bottom left are two that he used from his presentation that are um, students that he, that he had um, create them. And it's that idea of attaching it then to a, a um, real world current event that's happening and having them weigh in on that um, and, and tying that into a larger perspective, not just themselves, but what do they think about this larger issue. So the Me Too movement, the idea of respect and, and kneeling, um, and, and bringing that in and having a creative way for students to analyze that topic and then also to argue something about that topic. So these are great for units on identity. Um, you can reimagine vision boards, create personal images. Um, I Understanding the, the power of positive and negative space, too, my brain does not do that automatically. We have students in, my, in our art class on campus that make um, stamps where they have to carve out part of it so that you know, the part that is, is um, higher than the others is what actually stamps on the paper. And my brain has to think really hard <laughs> to do that. <laughs> I just, I wanna carve out all the things I'm not supposed to carve out. So this is a really great opportunity for students to understand that um, positive and negative space and the power within that negative and, power, uh, and positive space. So uh, he has instructions for a Chrome app as well as online access, and he breaks it all down. You don't have to have a green screen. Uh, we did some in the class in just front of a white wall and took the silhouette. Um, and so it was really easy. It was something that you could do right there in the workshop. And so it was an excellent, an excellent way of looking at how we can use images to make an argument or to introduce ourselves. YouTube genre mashup. This was also introduced to me at an EdTech conference up in Napa. And how many people are familiar with the YouTube genres? Um, so there are, there's Bat Dad, um, and these are, these are just a few, right? Because there are so many. The unboxing. So again, I mentioned I have a four-year-old. Oh my gosh. Blind bags and unboxing became my life. That kid's YouTube, oh my lord. Every, so if you don't know, it's these kids get these bags, these people are genius, and they have some toy inside of it. You don't know which one. And so you pull it open and, oh my goodness, you got the Mickey Mouse. Now collect all 7,000 others, right? And so that's the, the unboxing. And they have entire channels dedicated to this. <laughs> um, so there's a whole, a whole plethora of of genres out there on YouTube. What I love about this is that it has students be self-aware of what the genres are that they're consuming and the way that those work to pull in the audience. Um, but it's also a fantastic way of having students do presentations. So instead of just coming up here, and I would like for you and your group to do a presentation on cardiovascular system. Now, not only do you have to do a project on cardiovascular system, but you have to do it as Bat Dad. So you've got to mash those two together. And now, all of a sudden, as a student, I have to be familiar with the genre. If I don't know, I have to look it up. I have to figure it out. I then have to know about the cardiovascular system. And then I have to match the cardiovascular system and as Bat Dad present that. And if you guys don't know who Bat Dad is, Bat Dad trolls his wife 
with a Batman uh, mask on. And he does the really deep, gravelly voice. And he likes to surprise her. Again, he's a phenomenon on, on uh, YouTube. And so everybody's watching Bat Dad. And it is pretty funny, but I think I'd punch him if I had to live with him. Um, so we, at this uh, presentation, had to make our own. So I'm going to share with you the one that we had. We had unboxing, and we were working with the ITZY standards. And so we had to do unboxing for the empowered learner. I'm so excited. I have all of these boxes, and I'm going to unbox the empowered learner. I can't wait. Oh, I'm so excited. I hope I get the, the rare transfer or maybe uh, the, the, oh, it's, it's, oh, it's demonstrate through Flipgrid. I get to be in a powered learner by demonstrating through Flipgrid. I can pull it up on my iPad or I can use my phone. This is so cool. Okay, I'm an empowered learner and I'm going to try a new tool today. Let's try Google Keep. I can make a list of notes and check them off as I work. I could even do it right from my email, make a note and check off a list while I'm checking my email. Okay, what did I get in my box today? Oh, I have a tool for helping to transfer knowledge. For using YouTube, I can create how-to videos and different videos to help people know what I learned. Look everyone what I got. I got networking. We'll be working with our Google Classroom where everyone will have the chance to uh, build a community where we'll be learning everyone together. So we were given at that presentation 20 minutes to go through and create this. I filmed this with uh, Clips on Apple. I don't know if you guys are familiar, um, but there's an app called Clips, and it's super easy. You don't have to worry about whether you're filming this way or this way with your iPhone. Um, and I just changed the filter on it. The other thing that's really cool about this app is that there's a mosaic filter or a um, a comic book filter, and you can put it on as you're filming your students, and it kind of um, changes the way they look and masks their face. So it's something that you can protect your student's identity with the film, with the video, still see everything that they're doing, um, and understand what's going on, but protect their identity. And so this is a really great feature. Um, I love clips; super easy. My child wants to make movies now, so we use clips, and it's really easy to just one after the other. It's in um, very user friendly. So the, um, and you, the link is in the schedule, but you'll get it at the end as well, so you have access to all this. You guys can click on this, but here's the mashup. I did not create this. Um, in fact, if you click on the second uh, slide here, it'll give you uh, the person who did create this. So um, basically on the left, you have your topic, and then you have the genre, and you can change the pairings here. And then, it's not updating. There we go. And then it will change it. So you on the generator tab go in and put in whatever, com uh, whatever content you want them to be presenting on. You can pick and choose which genres depending on your age group and the, the, um, uh, how into YouTube genres your students are. And then it just mashes them up so you figure out how many groups you want and then you tell them, okay, so you've got this and you have to do it this way. Um, so this is a, a great way to kind of spice up presentations and have students try to uh, present the knowledge but also connect it to that genre. Actively learn. How many people know Edpuzzle? Okay, so I love Edpuzzle. I found out about Edpuzzle at a um, at a conference. Unfortunately, we contacted Edpuzzle to get them to sign the California Privacy um, Agreement, and they wanted us to pay for it, which our district was not uh, able or interested in doing. Um, and so, we have not been using Edpuzzle. So, um, we are using Actively Learn instead now. And Actively Learn is just like Edpuzzle, only it does video and it also does text. So basically what you do is you can go into a video and you can splice it and make it stop throughout and ask questions. So you can check for understanding, you can do little um, exit tickets as you go through in order for them to move on to the next piece. And then also for the text as well. So you can embed questions in there and have your students give feedback. And you can use this on your own afterwards to have that, to look through and see what the, um, 
what your students are learning and what they're taking in, where you need to hit points that maybe they missed. Or you can do it in the moment. And so while they're going through this, you can be checking their understanding as you're going through. Um, and you can give feedback and go forth. And so then you can uh, address what you need to, to look with look at with your um, students. So actively learn is really fun. Um, and again, it works with videos and it also works with articles. So it's another option. Um, and they uh, are willing to sign the Privacy Act. Emoji prompts. Again, I was introduced to emoji prompts uh, here at a Fall Q conference. And emoji prompts are great. Um, I use them with my speech and debate students. We often do take a stand or think on your feet, where in the old way was to grab little pieces of paper out of a, out of a bucket, and you have to speak about volcanoes for a minute, and then you have to give a pres presentation. So this is a new, fun uh, twist on that same idea. The emojis are random. They are all the appropriate emojis. Um, and timing is up to you. So for instance, if these emojis were the ones that came up, um, this might be the story that goes along with it. First, I took a taxi to get to my conference, but then it broke down, so I looked around and I saw a horse, and I thought, no way, it's been ages since I rode a horse, and how would, it, uh, how would I get it to like me anyway? But I remember that I had an ice cream cone in my bag, and away we went. And so you can use that to bring up different emojis and have the students speak on that. So for instance, and you just click and then, and it will pop up another one. And you're in control of how fast you want them to pop up. Do I have a brave volunteer who would like to try it? Oh no, I might have to do something. Anybody? Oh, I don't want to volunteer you to do it. Anybody? I'm seeing a lot of finger pointing. Tracy, help me out. <laughs> okay, so if I had Tracy come up here, here's her first emoji, and she would say, I hate football, okay. But she likes ice cream. You walk a mile through the ice cream to get to the football. <laughs> and then you'd have three scoops of ice cream on a stick. I don't know. Okay, so um, thank you. Round of applause for our volunteer. Yes, thank you. So, and you can let your students hang as long as you would like them to. So if you want them to add more about this, I'm going to say yoga pose, that they're talking about, then you leave it up there and make them talk about it until the next image pops up and then they can keep talking about it. Or you can make it rapid fire where they have to quickly go through um, and then you just stack them up there. So again, this is a great way to have students practice being up in front of people. It's a great way to have them talk about random topics to try and figure out how they all work together. Um, they can work on it with themselves. Um, like in small groups, you could do this as a large class. Um, so this is, this is fun. A lot of our um, AVID teachers have been using this for again, that just kind of getting up in front of people and being uh, comfortable speaking. Sketch notes. So sketch notes are super fun. Um, they are trending right now for sure. I took my first official sketch note uh, lesson, I think, at the beginning of the school year. I don't consider myself an artist, so I was very intimidated by sketch notes. Um, but I have gone to a, the session, and they teach you quick ways to draw. Um, you don't have to be an artist in order for it to work. I was actually just in a lunch. Uh, presentation for some freshman students the other day and they were talking about Cornell notes and just how how Cornell work, notes work and they were talking about how um, productive they can make your note taking and I talked to them afterwards and I was like have you guys have heard of sketch notes because sketch notes can be great too and they can also be combined with Cornell notes because you could use those images on the side there for part part of it so um, these are just some pieces on here um, I know some people who I can almost always tell the sketch noters at conferences because they have their tablets and their stylists, you know. Um, but people do it in notebooks as well. Um, and I find it's very helpful. I work with a teacher who is a doodler. She, she doodles. And she doodles to pay attention. Um, and you think that she's not paying attention, but she's doodling, and so she's very focused on what you're saying. And so she loves sketch notes because 
Now she just doodles what the person is talking about as opposed to just a random design. But this top one in the middle is hers. We teach Animal Farm, and she just on a whim started to draw a picture attached to Animal Farm. And the students came in the next day, and they were just fascinated by this image. And then as they read through the text, she would change the drawing on the board. And the students, it wasn't required, it was just on the board in the room. The students started coming into the classroom early to find out what was added to the picture or what changed. And it was this instant check for understanding because she would just listen to their conversations and they would run in and be like, okay, 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 where's, oh, Boxer, it's right there. And oh no, I can't believe that happened. And then they would start talking about it, right? And it was all outside of class. It was before class even started that they were already talking about what they were reading just because this image changed. And so it was this living image in class that all, all of a sudden just, you know, minds exploded with this understanding. Our ELL students started to become a little bit more involved because they had a picture that was attached to what they were reading. Um, and so they were starting to become more vocal and talking about what was happening. And so um, just this image that she started drawing for her own relaxation as after school one day um, became this huge teaching opportunity for her. Um, and so every year people would say, you know, do you have the teacher who draws the animal farm, you know, who has, has the animal farm drawing? And it became this thing, it sort of spread across campus. Um, and it wasn't even intended to be uh, a lesson or, or a teaching tool. So sketching as a teacher, having those images that go along with your, with your lessons to, to help the students visualize what they're reading, but then also to empower our students to think about harnessing visuals to help them understand the big concepts that are going on. And even if it's not strictly sketch noting, if they're still taking their regular bullet point notes, but they're tying those pictures into it, kind of that hybrid, which is more what I do, um, it's very helpful going back through to figure out what it is that you need to, to review. Mentimeter was something that I was introduced to at Fall Q last year. In fact, I was sitting where you were sitting, I'm pretty sure, except that we were at the other uh, auditorium when I was there. And um, they talked about Mentimeter. And I was like, this is amazing. This is a great, quick poll, find out from your students. And it has a visual aspect in, in there, too. So it still does your word clouds. Um, this one was from one that I did in class with my students. We were talking about utopias, and I asked them, you know, what do you think of, what word do you think of when you think of utopia? And I had them add these words, and then, yay, they came up with the idea of fake, right? That it's, it's not something that we can actually achieve. And then we started having a conversation based on their answers with, well, why can't we achieve it? What is it? You know, and we started pulling out these other pieces and talking about it and having this conversation. It was a great conversation starter. Um, and the students, of course, are super into it because they get to have their phones out and they get to answer. Um, and so it's a great way of using harnessing phones for that educational um, option instead of making them put them away, but to actually include them into the, the lesson. So let's try it out really quickly here. All right, so how is the presentation going so far? Please take your device, either your phone or your computer. Go to menti.com and use this code, 254266, and give me a rating. Is it sad? Is it so-so? Or is it, wow? So I did this exact same one with images for a dystopia. I told the students, I said, which image best describes a utopia, or excuse me, a dystopia? And I took three images and I had them vote. And then we had a conversation about the images and how the images represented a dystopia. And they started taking, you know, bringing in the content that we were talking about. They started talking about the text that we were looking at. Um, well, in this image, it has this, which made me connect it to this in the novel. And we had this really great conversation. So using the images to have people weigh in um, and, and represent their uh, ideas, I, I really liked that. And I hadn't seen that in any of these other uh, uh, programs for students to to weigh in and give their their feedback and I will mention that Cristiano Ronaldo in the center there does not always load so and when I give this presentation it tends to be a little bit of a lag there um, so you'll want to just make sure that you double check your images that they that they present this is the first time he's popped up on time actually so 
Video projects. I love video projects. Um, yes? With the Mentimeter, um, is there any filter? Or is it just everything they write could go straight up there? Everything they write could go straight up there, that every, the, what I've played with. I play primarily with the word cloud. Um, and so I, I don't believe that there's any way to filter, but I have not played with some of the other options. I usually just do it for a quick check with the word cloud and with the um, polling. So to my knowledge, no filter, but I can go back through and double check on some of those other ones. So video projects uh, have become a great way for me to check in with my students, check their understanding. Uh, and so I developed with a partner of mine a satirical video project. So we have our students read Brave New World and Fahrenheit 451. And then we have them make a satirical video. Uh, to show us that they understand satire, and that they understand how it is used, especially in literature. So we've made this uh, hyperdoc here on the side with lots of links for, with information. They have to make a communication objective, so they have to figure out what they're communicating, to whom are they communicating, who's their audience, excuse me, and then they also have a connection to the novels that they have to put together and talk about how it connects to what they've learned in the unit. They have to make a storyboard, which again includes those visuals, and so they have to visualize each of the different stages. And then they finally have to make a video, and the video is very short. This is our first video project that we do with them. It's only about a minute long. Um, and so we, we have later in the year a larger video project, so this is a great way to get them used to committing to the editing time and understanding how hard it is to collaborate multiple schedules for filming. And so, we put all this together. We gave them some examples. Um, we have some from Saturday Night Live, some videos from um, people who do this for a living, and then also some uh, commercials. But then we also made our own. So we used our school's uh, iographer and uh, green screen, and we filmed our own. I wore a green shirt that day, so be careful. Plan ahead if you're going to be <laughs> filming with a green screen. Um, but we filmed one for ourselves to give to our students. Like, there are people who make a living at this and who do great 100% professional work, but you can also do this with what we have here in our hallway. Um, which is what we're asking you to do. And so we have our students uh, fill these out. So I'm gonna show you a couple of them. I would like to remind you that these are high school students. Um, and so you would definitely have to consider how you would use this for elementary. I personally, we don't have WeVideo or any particular program in our district that we provide for our students. So I give them what I expect of the project and then I let them choose the tools that they wanna work with. I talked to them about YouTube having an editor. Most of our students are very graphically inclined anyway, and I find that a lot of our students have their own YouTube channels and they're making their own videos anyway. So generally, I'm behind and they can teach me. Um, but I just basically tell them that this is what I expect to see in the video, and then they can choose however they want to edit. I've had people film on a phone. I've had people bring in, I thought it was, I didn't know what it was, but it was this huge apparatus that he connected a camera to, this big rigging, and he brought it in. <laughs> so I have everything from novice, I've never done this before, to, you know, I'm in, I'm in our VAPA courses and I know exactly what I was going to do. Martin, did you have something? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So that's something else because I know when they're using video and the editor, YouTube editors, they still are in, in between before they update. Uh -huh. It's it's I call it iMovie with AI. Okay, and it's called what again? Uh, Adobe Premiere Rush. Adobe Premiere Rush, and that's through Adobe Spark. And I do love Adobe Spark. We use that when we first get our students involved with videos as well. So thank you for that. Um, so these are a couple of, op uh, of presentations I want to show you. We also don't tell our students what they have to present on. They get to choose, and oftentimes they choose information, or they choose topics that are important to themselves. Um, so the first one is about the, the gender norms there at the top, and then the second one, um, these students were really upset with the um, hypocrisy that they were seeing in some news, uh, some news well, celebrity news uh, channel. So these are the videos that they made, and I just want to show them to you really quick. Introducing Pitch and Shampoo's new product, the Couples Package. 
Pigeon's Woman Shampoo. It'll turn you into the perfect stay-at-home wife that you should be. Perfect for moisturizing your hair while spending all day cooking, cleaning, mending your husband's work suit, and fulfilling the American dream. For women, your brain may not be voluminous, but at least your hair will be. Pigeon Shampoo for men! This manly shampoo will help you establish your dominance over the female gender. This shampoo will make you strong, not weak, and like the woman shampoo. You don't want to be some girl, do you? Pigeon shampoo, made perfectly for each gender as they should be. Right? I loved it. And I did blur out their faces with YouTube. There is an option to go back through and to blur out faces to protect a student identity. So this one lended itself towards that. So I wanted to use that feature to show you that that is available. And it will automatically go through and find the faces. And it's really great. And then if it misses one, you can go in at the time and figure out exactly where you want that, uh, that blur to go. And then this is the second one here. How are you guys doing? Welcome to BS News Special on the latest Hollywood relationships. Oh my god, did you hear? Nick and Priyanka tied the knot. Now let me remind you, your favorite Jonas brother is still only 26 years old, and he's already married to who? That Indian clout chaser from Quantico. And his wife just happens to be 36 years old. It's a 10 year age gap, oh my god. Take a look at this picture from the 2000s. She was already a woman and you're just a boy. Now let's hear from some of Nick's devoted fans in our live studio audience. God, what a cougar. Nick's too good for Priyanka. She's obviously just a failed actress who's fishing for money. He's literally married to a grandma. Yeah. Nick, why would you do this? Aren't you famous enough? Yeah. What a global scam of this. She definitely trapped her for the fame and money she couldn't get on her own in India. You know who we should be talking about though? Jay-Z and Beyonce's birthday bash! Yeah, they're such an amazing couple. Also, Jay-Z just turned 49. Beyonce and Jay-Z obviously belong together, even though Beyonce's like 12 years younger than her. So my students that created this, they asked me, they were like, um, they were really upset because they loved Priyanka Chopra before she was even an, an American actress. And they were like, I can't believe she's getting all of this bad press. And I was like, well, you have an opportunity <laughs> to share. And so that's what they did. And so I loved it because it gave them voice. Um, they got to share ideas that were bothering them, that they saw these inconsistencies and that they wanted to address. Uh, they fulfilled the project requirements. They attached it to what they learned about satire and the lessons and, and warnings that we get. Um, and so video projects are great and the students love it. Um, they do take some time giving the students time to film and then edit and giving them adequate time to go in there and, and do all of the work that needs to be done. But my students love video projects. They're very easy for me to grade um, and very entertaining for me to grade and so I love it and as an option for students to show me what they learned and to give me to apply that and give me these video projects book bentos so book bentos was something that I was introduced to um, by Lisa Highfill and I was talking to her about looking for a new way to have students present and she was explaining to me book bentos and so she said it started as a hashtag on Instagram where people would take an image with a cover of a novel and then um, items that tied to that novel somehow and then that's how they would present their their book projects, their book reports. And then the really cool thing was that a lot of librarians were taking these students' book bentos and they were enlarging them and putting them around libraries as advertisements for these novels. And so it was great because these students then got to basically encourage their classmates uh, and their schoolmates to be reading these novels. So the idea is based on the bento, the bento box, right? With the multiple items in their places inside the tray. And so they lay them out this way. And then the, they have these little anchors over here and they use, this particular one uses ThingLink. So when you hover over these anchors, it gives you a text box, it takes you to another website, it gives you a video, and it gives you more, more um, information. So at this point in the year when I'm teaching Siddhartha with my students, um, 
I'm, I'm tired of Google Slides at this point, and my students kind of are too. So I wanted something new for them to present, and so we used this tool, and it was awesome. So I, I took the book Bento, and we changed it. The students were doing background presentations, and so we changed it to background Bentos. And the students presented, they had to talk about um, India, Hinduism, um, Gandhi, they had a bunch of different topics that they worked on in a group. Now I will say ThingLink um, does not have the privacy um, uh, requirement signed that I am aware of, and it's not collaborative. So um, when I had my students working in groups, it was very hard for multiple people to work on the same image together. So I had to kind of, I, I, we've, we fudged it a little bit, we tried some different things, we had one person work on it, and then the other group, they kind of collaborated on a doc that they could all work on, and then they went into ThingLink. It wasn't ideal, I have been told that ThingLink is going to become collaborative, and at that point I'm gonna reach out to them and find out a little bit more about it, but it worked pretty well. The really cool thing about this was that one of my students um, one of my Indian students came up to me afterwards and we were chatting and she's like, I really liked this project. She's like, but you know, Bento, and she's like, that's Japanese. And she's like, since we're reading Siddhartha and it's in India, she goes, you should really make it a background Thali. And I was like, what? And so she brought up a picture of, of a Thali, which is the same idea, but it's a round plate and lots of different little pieces, like food and stuff on it. And so she's like, you should do that. And so I incorporated my student into my presentation for this year. And so I have a picture of the book bento, and then it fades out and it becomes the background Thali. And then I give her credit because um, she helped me become more culturally aligned with the topic and the content that we were in. And so it was this really cool thing. Um, and my students had a great time presenting the images. They put a lot of thought into these images. Um, the, the items that they collected, the way that they laid them out for their image and, and uploaded it to then um, give me the information on it. Um, they were very concerned about the visual presentation uh, and the items that were in their visual. And it was a great way for them to share the information with myself and with all of their classmates um, without being just a standard stand up and go through the slides kind of, uh, kind of presentation. So it was the change that we needed at the time in the classroom. Petcha Flickr is very similar to the emoji app that I was showing you before, only images pop up. Uh, I again was introduced to this idea at a, a Q conference. So the random images pop up for whatever topic you put in. It's great for improv. It's great for standing up and having to give a presentation and just getting used to being in front of an audience. Um, you can go into the advanced setting and choose the number of images that you want to have pop up and for how long they stay up in front of the students. Um, this one is not always school appropriate though. So you wanna make sure that you check your topics ahead of time. Um, someone in one of my other uh, presentations had a really great idea of doing what I did basically here and filming, like to put in your topic and then screencastify or film the screen so that you know what images are gonna pop up and then present that in front of the students so you don't have to worry about something really inappropriate popping up in front of everyone. Um, so you can, you can uh, limit that uh, a little bit with that. Um, so this is a great way to, to have students just come up and talk and again, include those visuals and um, be figuring out how they could present around those. New York Times, what's going on in this picture? I was introduced to this by one of our first year teachers. I kept walking past her classroom and she'd have an image up on the screen and it was, what's going on in this picture? And I finally asked her, I was like, what are you doing? And she goes, it's this really cool thing on New York Times. Is anyone familiar with this? So this is a really cool thing. Um, every week, New York Times presents a picture and they've removed the caption from the picture. And the question is, What's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And like, you know, what more can you find uh, to, to basically pr um, to make an argument about what's going on in this picture? So she had the students on their own journal and talk about what they saw in the picture, why they thought was going on. They used the different um, context clues within the image. And then they'd have a conversation. And then there would be some discussion. Well, no, I thought it was this. No, I thought it was this. Oh, that's an interesting point. I didn't think about that. I didn't notice that detail. And so they'd have this big conversation. And then on Mondays, if the students wanted to, they could join a global discussion and talk about what they think is going on in the 
in the image. And then on Thursdays, when you go back to visit the image, it actually has the caption on there. And so you can see how you did. Like, how close were you? Did you use all the clues? What clues were you missing? Um, is there anything that would have suggested that it was what it was that you didn't think it was? And so she practices this every week with her students. It's her opener. She puts her, her, she puts her picture up. They write about it, they talk about it, and then on Thursday they check in, and then they talk about it. And so these students are focusing on paying attention to what they're already taking in, figuring out why do they think what's going on in this picture is going on in this picture, and then being able to talk about it. And I love the idea that if you, through New York Times you can go to that larger global audience as well and talk with them about you know, what you think. So it's not just a classroom discussion if you don't want it to be. You can go bigger than that. So this is a great option, um, and I've done it myself just for fun uh, a few times, and so I, I like checking in and just kind of seeing. So this one has to do with um, a tennis match. He's down below watching the tennis match that's happening. Um, I don't follow tennis, so I can't remember exactly who it was, but it was a really big game, and he was down there watching it underneath there. Memes and GIFs. So memes and GIFs, again, like I said when I first got up here, they've just kind of taken over. Um, I, for the longest time, I'd have students include images in their presentations, and then I would say probably three or four years ago now probably, all of a sudden students started raising, can we put memes in our presentations? Is that okay? Yeah. As long as they're appropriate, like put them in there. In fact, better yet, make your own. And so they started including all of these in their, in their presentations and, uh, and then talking about how you could make them as well. And so again, memes are just these great, we have so many, how many of you know a famous meme? Like you look at it and it's the same picture, maybe it has different things on it. So for instance, that Willy Wonka one in the center, I see that one everywhere, right? Uh, at the very beginning of my presentation, the Ryan Gosling, hey girl, one is really funny. Uh, I was just reading some really funny tweets the other night or about, about people who met a famous person and didn't realize that they were famous. And a lady posted, uh, posted a tweet and she said, yeah, I was at this play and I was sitting next to this guy and I was hanging out. She's like, and then I looked at him and he said, you just now realized who I was, didn't you? And she said, I did. He goes, you must not get on Instagram very often. And she had been sitting right next to Ryan Gosling through the entire play and didn't realize it until the very end. But it was funny. He was like, you don't go on Instagram very often because he's in all the hey girl Instagrams uh, or memes. So some of these are very famous and we'll see different things written on them. And you can harness that in class and have that apply to whatever you're going over academically in class. So uh, we went to a rock star for ELA specifically last year through Q, me and my two lead teachers. And it was down in Southern California. And I was introduced to this idea here. And um, they were talking about just using it for checking for understanding, for assessments even, and having students tell you that they understand what's going on in the, in the, in the context of your classroom. So our AP literature class took it. They work with um, the chorus, the Greek chorus in, in uh, theater, and the students have a hard time understanding the purpose of the chorus and how the chorus operates and, and all of that. So in order to spice up that presentation a little bit and that lesson, they have the students include memes or make memes that went along with their analysis. And at first they did it just as extra credit, but almost every student in class did it. And so now they made it a part of the, of the assignment. And so um, the students were really excited to do this assignment. And the, one of the teachers said, she's, they're never excited to do this assignment. She's like, this is always that boring and I've thought about how I can spice it up. And so she used the memes and it made it, uh, it, made it a lot more palatable for the students. So, um, you can use these in your class here. So for instance, show me you understand. You can give them the memes that you want them to use, or the pictures, excuse me, the images. So some of these are really f uh, famous ones that we see. So you give them the image and you say, all right, so based on last night's reading, show me that you understand a concept from the reading. Um, and so they can then figure out which one fits best for what they want to do. So for instance, of mice and men, I understand that they get the that they get it, right? This is a very famous meme or image.
we just finished Lord of the Flies in our in our class. So. So again, just ways to check to make sure that they understand. Um, so having them come up with the the topic, or giving them the topic, and then having them use the images. So again, you could go through multiple different uh, disciplines that these could be used for. Um, same thing with um, GIFs. So Giphy, and there are instructions in here for you. You can make your own, which I use them all the time. It has a little like um, add-on in your text. And so again, that's where I pull all my, all my GIFs from. But you can make your own from, from video footage as well. So these are the instructions on how to do that. I don't know if this is how school is for you guys, but a kid takes a test and then it's like, how was it? What happened? Was it hard? <laughs> and you just give them, a, uh, give them a, a topic. So this one is, you know, teacher life. So um, you give them a topic, and then they have to come up with one to show you what they've, what they've learned or um, how to apply it. And we don't have time because we are uh, on a shorter schedule here, but usually I have you guys create some so you can um, add to that or check that out to see if anyone. So here's some resources, just some little tips that I've gathered along the way. Unsplash is royalty-free images. Um, there is an add-on in Google Slides, which you have to be 13 or older, and there's some privacy issues depending on your district. Adobe Spark is an entry-level uh, video program. What I love about that is it automatically gives royalty rights at the end for any images or any songs that are used within it. So it kind of trains the students, even though they don't have to collect that data at first. Um, it puts that all in there so they get to that idea of I need to give credit for when I take things from other people. Um, Nimbus is a great screen capture. Um, you don't have to sign in to use it, so I really like that one. Um, Creative Commons to check to see if it's appropriate to use Google Search, um, being able to use reusable images. It came up in one of my other conferences. If you search for a Google image through slides, you know when you can in input an image and it brings up all the images. Someone asked in one of my presentation or one of a presentation that I went to, does that bring up usable, reusable images only, like the non-copyright ones? And I tested it the other day, and it looks like it does. So I searched for something on Google, um, and then I, I changed the, the usage rights, and then matched what was in um, Google. So if you search through Google for images, it automatically gives you the ones that are free of copyright. Um, Kittle is another visual. Uh, Visual search engine for littles, which is great. Remove.bg will remove the background of an image. It is scary, scary effective. Um, I've played with Photoshop for a really long time, and it can be a real hassle to remove the image from a background. And this does it flawlessly um, and really, really quickly. And you can just have a URL. So you find an image and then paste the URL in, and then it will remove the background, and poof, you can put it into a presentation. And so it's just really, really quick. Um, there is the California Privacy Agreement, so you can check to make sure that something that you want to use is appropriate to use for your students, so that link is on there for you as well. And then Drive Slides um, is a way to create a Google Slides presentation out of a Drive folder of images. So it automatically takes a folder full of images and then puts it into, an, uh, into a slide deck for you so that you can show that uh, very easily. So that is an extra little step. So just some little fun resources that might make your life easier uh, as you use images with your students. That is all I have for you today. I really appreciate you coming in and listening to me talk about all of this. There's the bit.ly if you didn't get it in the schedule um, that's on there. I'm at Dublin High School, which is just west of here um, in East Bay. I'm a technology coordinator and an English teacher. Uh, that is my handle there for Twitter, so I would love to follow you and find out what you're into. Um, so reach out, let me know. Thank you. <laughs>